Bonjour. Bonjour, monsieur. Hey, everybody. I hope you all are doing well. And welcome back. And it's the end of the month. So that means it is time for our October Whiskey Hall. Yay! And this month, and in this hall, well, it's probably one of the most epic halls we have ever had. There are literally no mediocre bottles floating around in this one. Just pure, beautiful bottles from Buffalo Trace, including three different levels of Blanton's, Weller's 12, and some super-duper rare Japanese whiskeys from Yamazaki, as well as Nika. I mean, <laughs> I'm just getting excited thinking about it. So, we'll go over the bottles, how much I pay for them, and why I decided to cart these all the way back from Paris to add to my collection. Now, before we get to it, if you like these videos of the hauls and of the wanders and of all the reviews and all the other great stuff we got cooking up for you, don't forget to like and subscribe. That way you can get notified when our newest videos come out every single Sunday and sometimes in between. All right, now let's get down to it. All right, so with a haul like this, uh, it really only makes sense to start off with just a little bit of a whiskey check. So today, I'm going to be enjoying something that is a little bit higher than my usual daily affair, uh, which is this Redbreast 21. And uh, it's an Irish whiskey. It's one of my favorites. And <laughs> by now, you should realize they're kind of all my favorites. But it feels like something that is definitely appropriate to start, start off such an epic whiskey haul as this one is going to be. So let's get the top off here. <laughs> a little bit of whiskey. Oh. And the whiskey. Because, look, honestly, you can never drink too much of it. You can only just drink it too fast. Cheers. Mmm. Man, that is good. Alright, so let's kick this haul off with one of the bourbons uh, that I, that we, I guess to be honest, because it is a family affair, have really been struggling to find here in the US, which is this Weller 12. And I mean, here on the West Coast, I don't know, I mean, you can find it, right? It is possible to find it, um, but it is quite expensive. The markup on it is astronomical. It's got the trash bags from Paris on it. I don't know if you all can see that. The market bond of it is quite expensive and it's just quite competitive as well. I mean, it's just off the chart to try to get something like this at a reasonable price and it get there in time to get it. Now, it is as uh, pretty much one of the only real age statements in the Weller collection. It makes it very, very sought after. I guess the easiest way to say it. Um, so I was super excited to get this one. And in fact, uh, kind of kicking myself for not picking up a second one that we were offered. Um, because the officer went and said, ah, you know what, well, I'm sure we'll find it somewhere else. And boy, were we wrong. So I guess I'll have to go, an excuse to go back. Now, believe it or not, there are a fair amount of amazing whiskey shops all around Paris. Whether you're in central Paris or whether you're in St. Germain or in the Latin Quarter. I mean, you can find good whiskey pretty much everywhere. I mean, it just seems like Parisians have an appreciation and a love of whiskey just as much as anybody else, including us Americans. And really, why shouldn't they? Now, this Weller uh, specifically is a 700 milliliter bottle, which you can see there, uh, which always kind of sucks. It makes me a little sad, but hey, you know what? We didn't have to pay the VAT tax on it, so, you know, there is always that. Uh, the ABV on it is at 45%, and we got this Weller 12 for, believe it or not, 39 euros and 98 cents, which, if we change that to dollars, especially right now with the US dollar being so strong, uh, it actually comes out to 39 dollars and and cents, which is a huge, massive, and really refreshing difference from the 200 or even $300 or more that we see them on the shelves at the liquor stores or just anywhere back home. It's just, just, just laughable how much they are gouging us for these bottles. But then again, maybe it's kind of our own fault too. Hmm. So obviously the reason I picked this one up is basically uh, it's at MSRP. Uh, it is one of the wellers that is missing in our collection and because Really, it's the only true age statement Weller in the standard Weller line, so it was sort of a no-brainer to pick it up um, so we can add it to the collection, and it was one that we were missing. Do you have your 
Now moving along onto this Buffalo Trace train, we have yet another bottle that is, I would say, less difficult to get than the Weller 12 stateside, but still can be pretty hard unless you know a guy or maybe uh, just being lucky or being in the right place at the right time, which is this Blanton's Original. And you will notice this one uh, specifically is not full. In fact, it is quite empty. <laughs> And the reason for this uh, is because why we were in the land of milk and honey as far as Blanton's go, which is the beautiful city of Paris, where Blanton's essentially grows on trees, it kind of sort of totally made sense just to have something to enjoy between the Andouillettes and the Mona Lisas and the Eiffel Towerings. And, you know, once you open it, you can't really bring it back on the plane. So this one has been opened and it was drank in Paris. And I'll tell you what, uh, these plantains, they go quite well with those 3 a.m. cheddar cheese uh, hamburgers. So, <laughs> definitely a recommendation. Now, this one we got for 72 euros, uh, which uh, comes out to $70.56, which is still a bit over the price that we find here on the U.S. If you can find it at, um, you know, like a Costco, I think last year or earlier this year, in fact, we saw it for $46.99, but you got to be the first guy in the door to get it. Um, so there's definitely still some price shenaniganry uh, going on here. But still, it's sort of a midline price, uh, and it's a great bourbon to have uh, traveling around. And instead of paying, you know, thirty dollars a shot at the Hemingway Bar, you can buy the whole thing for seventy and enjoy it throughout the time you're staying there. Now, this blend in specifically, uh, it was dumped on 5 17 2021. Um, it was from Warehouse H. If you all can see that, it's from Warehouse H, Rick Number Two, uh, and it is 93 proof. And I guess, <laughs> I wouldn't say, uh, I mean, I guess fairly enough, it's not like we're really adding this one to the collection as a whole uh, because it's empty, but we did get it during the month, so I'm still adding it to the haul. So that is the Blanton's Original, delicious wherever you are in the world. Now we start getting into the Blanton's that are basically, basically impossible to get here in the good old US of A. One, because they purposely don't sell them domestically, which is, again, going to be a whole nother video, but also because they produce less of them than the normal Blantons, uh, and these ones really just don't even hit the shelves if they ever do come to America. This, of course, is the one that I'm talking about, which is the Blantons Gold, which is also empty for the same exact reason that his friend the Blantons original is. But luckily, I did end up picking up a second one on the way out, uh, which has not been open, which I am super thankful for. Now, the Blanton's Gold um, is typically, like I said, only sold internationally. Oh, I have my advanced uh, packing devices here. <laughs> it's only sold internationally uh, or typically at duty-free shops. Uh, this one specifically has an ABV of, let's see here. It's got an ABV 51.5%. If you all want to take a look at that. That is a beautiful bottle, by the way. I mean, the presentation on it is spectacular. Le spectacular? I don't know how the French would say that. <laughs> but, but you get the drift on it. So, yes, basically, it's normally only told, sold uh, internationally. Um, and at the 51.5%, you basically just get a 5% boost over the normal original Blanton's, the one we just talked about. Uh, but the quiet, the cost on it is quite a big step up, and uh, the cost can can really vary wildly there, like here in the U.S., um, basically depending on where you get it. So, uh, for example, this Blanton's Gold that we got uh, in Paris, uh, I believe we paid 103 euros, uh, which is $100.94 at today's conversion price, which is still considerably less than the approximate 200 <laughs> or some odd dollars, uh, or maybe even 300 that you would find it for uh, here. Uh, on, on state side. All right, so let's talk a little bit about the full bottle first uh, because, well, it's the one that's full and really at this point is the one that matters. Um, it was dumped on 8 9 2021. Um, it is from uh, barrel number 545 from Warehouse H, Rick number 38, and it has 103 proof on it. Um, now, so obviously, uh, like the Weller, the Blanton's Gold is basically. <laughs> It's basically a no-brainer, especially if you can find it at $100 or so to pick it up. I mean, that is a killer deal. 
Also, um, you know, probably it seems like the price is relatively fair. I mean, yeah, it's $30 more for essentially 5% ABV more, but you know, that's kind of the way that plantains go. But I think anything higher than that, I, I don't think I would pay, you know, in hindsight. Uh, also, it was something that was missing from our collection, uh, something that we did not have and is, again, relatively difficult to find here in the U.S. Um, so, you know, with the availability uh, in the U.S., with finding it abroad and for finding it at a reasonable price, reasonable price, you know, again, it was another great thing that we wanted to pick up and it was worth hauling back in the suitcase uh, and getting through customs and all that kind of fun stuff. So now we get to move into the big boys of the Blanton's line. That is the infamous the powerful and the elusive Blanton's straight from the barrel, affectionately referred to as SFTB. Now this one is really the highest ABV of the standard line of Blanton's, uh, which I believe is the primary difference <laughs> between this one and the gold as well as the original Blanton's. I don't know if you all can see that, but it's got a very kind of cool experimental handwritten label on it really definitely makes you feel real special when you're looking at it because that is just a cool bottle. Um, it's not frilly, but you know what's inside is going to have a good impact. And in fact, um, on the reviews, this one, uh, the reviews typically say that it, it perhaps is a little too hot to keep that renowned Blanton's perfect balance that we all know and are accustomed to. Now, like it sounds, because it is uh, straight from the barrel, uh, at least to me, that means that this Blanton's is the literal and the figurative purest form of Blanton's. The most Blanton's of Blanton's. Delicious Blanton's. The brownest of the brown liquors. <laughs> So I'm super excited to actually have this one and be able to try to bust it out uh, at some point here in the near future where we can do a review of it and also compare it to the gold and its little brother's the original Blanton's. Uh, now, of course, the Blanton's SFTB is yet another of the Blanton's family line that is only supposed to be sold uh, in non-US markets, which explains why you're able to find it in Paris. And from what I could find on the interweb, um, this whiskey actually has uh, in it a uh, whiskey that is aged six years old, at least purportedly. This one specifically has an ABV of a whopping 62.5% ABV or 124.1 proof, <laughs> which is, uh, is, is again, massive for, uh, for a Blanton's. Um, it was dumped on 1-2022-2021 from barrel 159. It is bottle 131. I don't know if y'all can see that. It's bottle 131. Came from warehouse H and rick number 48 so you know i guess it probably it roomed down the down the dorm down the hallway from uh from these two knuckleheads the underclassmen i guess we can call it now this was the last piece of the blanton's original line uh you know having the gold having the original and now having the sftb that i was missing from the collection of course there's those kind of other rot odd ones that do come out here and there that are super hard to find but <laughs> you're not going to find those on shelves um, but, uh, you know, this is one that I really like to have around because, uh, although it's not open yet, I know bottles like this, I tend to bust them out on special occasions or sometimes on that rare occasion, um, I'll pull these out, you know, there's a moment, a very specific moment that hits you where your body hits the right amount of intoxication between soberness and drunkenness that almost conspires with all your senses to have the best whiskey tasting experience. And at those moments... That's when I pulled out things like this Blanton straight from the barrel uh, or some of the other great bottles that we got. So, um, you know, I don't really know how to describe that moment, but if you know it, you definitely know it. <laughs> so uh, I'm super excited to have this bottle as an addition to the collection. And for sure, the next time I'm rambling through Europe, whatever that happens to be, um, I'm going to keep an eye out for another bottle of this straight from the barrel because uh, my suspicion it's going to be amazing and I'll be really sad that I only got one of them. All right, so now we are moving into the really heavy hitters, moving into those most exclusive and considerably more expensive whiskeys that I was able to find while rambling around in whiskey hunting through Paris. Uh, which again, is to say something considering we're talking about some of these kind of rare Blantons that are hard to find. Um, but these next ones arguably are a step up in tier, not specifically about the whiskey, uh, but as far as the overpricing, the competitiveness, and the highly demandedliness, <laughs> I guess how you say it, um, which is specifically this Nika Takitsura 17. <laughs> 
Look at that. That is a beautiful Japanese bottle of whiskey. Now this one I was super excited to find uh, because like Blanton's it is almost impossible to find in the US and doubly that impossible to find at a reasonable price especially now after Nika has paused perhaps permanently uh, the production of any of their age statement whiskeys. Um, so finding any age statement whiskey from Nika let alone one of the older ones although 17 is not the oldest one but uh, you know it's definitely a real treat. Now the Nika 17, uh, this one specifically has an ABV of 43%. So again, Nikas and the Japanese whiskeys in general, there are exceptions to that, but in general are not known for being ABV heavy hitters. So um, this is, is definitely a whiskey with a light touch. Um, it has an age statement of obviously 17 years old on it, and it is basically the beginning of the higher end of the Nika age statements. Uh, there is the 21, uh, which is, again, considerably harder to find. The 25 and the 45, which, I mean, to get them, if they you can find them, and if they are still in existence, you gotta have Scrooge McDuck money for them. I mean, there's just no way around that. Uh, actually, you know what? You can still find the the, the 21, uh, even at places like Costco. Uh, I, I know we got some earlier this year, but this week at Nika 17, uh, I was able to get it for 390 euros, uh, which translates into 382 dollars and 20 cents USD. Now, when thinking just purely about the price for this Nika 17, I mean. It's not maybe the best price you could probably find for the Nika 17, either here or abroad. But I decided to bring it up and, uh, you know, subsequently Sherpa it back to the USA because I really do love the Nika line from what I've had so far. I mean, I have uh, the Nika coffee grain, which I've always enjoyed, as well as the malt. And these were the first whiskeys that got me into Japanese whiskey as a whole. So it's always going to be kind of a, a warm spot in my heart. Um, but, you know, I want to see what the Nika was like with an age statement rather than, you know, the blends like these ones. And uh, hopefully it gives me a glimpse into the heart of what the Nika whiskey tradition truly is in its purest form and ultimately enhance my love and ad admiration for it uh, and experience the whole brand at uh, at its purest. So that's why I got this one. Super excited to have this one and to have brought it back and uh, to eventually try it here uh, on, on, the, on the YouTube. So Nika 17. Now, for those of you who have made it this far, I have saved the best for last. Um, and it is yet another unicorn Japanese whiskey bottle for those of you who enjoy the understated, the subtle, and the quiet, confident nuances that comes with Japanese whiskey, which is this Yamazaki 18. Ta-da! <laughs> uh, yes, it is 700 milliliters. I think these are all 700 milliliters, unfortunately. Uh, I got my secure... Uh, uh, packaging on it to help it uh, avoid being broken or anything like that. Very, very sophisticated. And uh, this Yamazaki is uh, the most original example uh, still available today of Japanese whiskey. Um, and sort of kind of has a relationship with Nika, uh, the, se in the 17 and the 21 and the other ones, and, and the manufacturer as a whole, it's kind of a similar relationship as Ferrari and Lamborghini in the sense that they, they came from the similar school of thought but just had different visions and went their own ways and had developed their own independently very interesting and equally competitive Japanese whiskeys. Now the Yamazaki 18, or for whatever reason, <laughs> does seem to be a little bit easier to find in the US than, um, than the Nika, uh, despite uh, being considerably older and considerably more expensive. Uh, I'm guessing maybe they just made more of it. Uh, you know, I'm not really sure exactly why, but that just seems to be the case. Either way, I found this Yamazaki 18 here in Paris for 875 euros. And it was the last bottle that they had, and we just had to ask them if they had it hidden behind the counter. Otherwise, we wouldn't have ever seen it. Um, <laughs> I mean, even now, I can feel the bank account warning signs pew, 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 going off. <laughs> we got this one. But that 875 euros comes out to $857.50. So thank God for that um, <laughs> that, that exchange rate. Uh, again, I think uh, it was still a pretty good deal uh, for normal circumstances, except for, uh, you know, again, the bottle that we got earlier this year at Costco was $279 in comparison to $857. So, you know, there's that. But um, this one has an ABV of 43%. Uh, like the Nika and like many of the Japanese whiskeys is a very common percentage uh, and I picked this one up uh, for triple the price because well it's still less than what you would normally find in the USA and uh, I need at least one more bottle to feel comfortable opening uh, the other ones that we already got 
Um, because I, I, in much in the same way I love the Nika, I also love the Yamazaki. They're two sides of the same coin. So I'm really excited to have this one. Uh, and it's, an, you know, it, it puts me over that comfortable bottle anxiety top of being able to open one up, which I will do and we'll do a great tasting and go over it here on the channel as well. So super excited to have this, super excited to uh, make it back from Paris and, uh, and really uh, come back with some great whiskeys. All right, so that's it for today, and thanks for watching to the very end of my epic Paris Whiskey Haul. And if you like the hauls, if you like the wanders, the reviews, and all the other great stuff we got cooking up for you, don't forget to like and subscribe so you can get notified when our newest videos come out on Sundays and sometimes in between. Now, before I go, I just want to remind you, if you do see a whiskey that you love, just buy it. Because if you don't, somebody else surely will, and it might even be me. All right, everybody, have a great rest of your week. I'm out, and adios.